so much, Ian and David Bouvet. We appreciate both of you and the talents that you share with us each week. It is a delight to see each and every one of you here gathering in our sanctuary today. It's great to welcome one another. It's great to be in sense of community with one another. And it's a delight to be with you. It is our passion. It is our hope that during this time of this pandemic that we are learning new ways to be connected and to feel this sense of community with one another. I'm so glad that you've joined us today via live streaming and I'm glad that for each and every one that is here present in our sanctuary. Let's take a deep breath as we enter into this time of just listening to what the Spirit has for us and the teaching that it offers for us. Because I believe the Spirit of God wants to teach and speak to us in this moment. Do you believe the same? If so, then let's breathe in this fresh awareness to get breath. Breathe in and release. And just reset your thoughts for a moment to be so centered in the divine presence that your heart, your mind, your very essence is ready to receive all that the Spirit has for us in this moment. Amen. You know, sometimes it seems that we're born to be afraid, you know, and that's not really true, but it may seem that way. It may seem that from the very beginning of inception of our life, the very beginning of those moments of breathing from that very start, that we were somehow invited to a journey of fear. You know, we hear it as a small child, honey, be careful. We hear all these things that are uh, from our parents and those around us, caution, caution, watch out, watch out. You know, from the very moment you went off to school and you're boarded the bus, parents are at the bus stop saying, honey, honey, be careful. Do you ever hear a mother say, honey, go out and take risks today. Uh, go out and just do something exciting and, you know, really stretch yourself and, you know, go ahead and, and try something new. You know, we don't really find a lot of parental advice in that direction, but it's a lot about caution and it's a lot about awakening ourselves to fear. Fear being an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, causing pain for our lives, or maybe that someone or something is a threat. Yes, I know that there is a fear that is a respect for all things, a fear that is good and sense that it is a respect, such as the respect of fire, and we learn not to burn ourselves, or the respect of gravity and learn not to jump off of tall buildings, uh, unless of course we're Superman, uh, and learn the, under the respect for the depths of water and learning how to swim or how to m maneuver through uh, the power and energy of water, fire, or gravity. But what I'm speaking about today is the fear that grips our lives that has created barriers and walls and separation and it's void of respect for one another. A fear caused by a belief that is recycled over and over again, a belief that is taught that we are not one, a belief that creates this consciousness or thinking of separation, of duality, of all these kind of things that are divisive in our world that are responding uh, to the fear that we have within our lives. These beliefs they begin to cultivate it and to create a greater depth of it within our day-to-day -day experience. But actually, I want to tell you this, that you are born fearless. That's right. When you come uh, into this world grasping that first breath, you're coming in this, to this world with great essence of strength and confidence. You're born fearless. Yet our fearlessness slips away from us as we grow older and we begin to embrace the thinking of the culture around us. We begin to embrace the thinking of our society, our family, and we are taught all sorts of things to become afraid of. And we sort of welcome all these phobias, fears into our life. And we begin to accept them because, well, they're our norm. They're what everyone's speaking about, what everyone's talking about. Be afraid of this, be fearful of that, be cautious of this, be cautious of that. Do we often take the time to really check them out and examine them? But quite often we get caught up in this very societal consciousness, the thinking of our culture, the thinking of the world around us. And we inherit the legacy of this race mind, the legacy of this 
community, the legacy of the thinking of the world around us. We inherit a way of thinking in our society and it forms in our religions that sort of creates all these walls and barriers and judgments and yes, even fears of others. And as a result, people have created a world of phobias. There's all kinds of irrational fear and aversion to others. You're different than me, I'm afraid of you. I am frightened because you think differently. I'm afraid of you because you may speak differently. You look differently. On goes the list. And we create these fears that are based on a, a lack of really res understanding and having a respect for one another. These fears create this sense of racism that we're dealing with so strongly within our country right now. We're having to ask ourselves questions about the fears and the, that have created a lack of respect for one another. Fears of homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, and misogynistic thinking, religious phobias, all these kind of ideas that are based in fear-based teachings. They're all going out in our society, our thinking and the consciousness surrounding us, surrounding us, and we get sometimes caught up into them. But there's a beautiful passage of scripture that comes to us from Corinthians, the 12th chapter as a prelude to the beautiful love chapter, Corinthians 13. The last verse offers these words, and there is a more excellent way. A more excellent way a more excellent way of thinking, and it begins to unfold then this beautiful love chapter for our lives, an understanding that this is the uh, really overarching way of our thought. Our thinking needs to be surrounded through this power of love and removing ourselves from a fear-based consciousness, a world that is so filled with fear, fear of one another, fear of what's going on, fear of events, fear of uh, all kinds of experiences, fear of the unknown, fear that's gripping us because it's full of misunderstandings. What quite often what happens is we recycle beliefs, true or not, because they go unchecked. We have all these kind of beliefs that we hear something so often and we don't question it, so we take it as truth and we say an untruth enough times the people begin to believe it and we begin to make it true. And that's one of the challenges that we have in our lives. We become like sheep and we are often led astray by just some thought uh, that we begin to entertain. We hear it over and over again and we begin to believe it is true. Do you, things like, you know, we've been told you only use 10% of your brain. You know that that's not true? We've been told eating carrots improves your eyesight. Do you know that that's not true? Vitamin C cures the common cold. Do you know that that's not true? Most recently, we're seeing gays cause God's wrath on America. Do you know that that's not true? I hope you do. Women are not as smart as men. We hear this over and over again. Uh, people begin to uh, convey these kind of thoughts and ideas, and so we just assume these things, but we know that that's not true. People of other races are not as intelligent as my race, someone may say, and we know that's not true. None of these things are true, but the facts or the truth sometimes doesn't really matter to the world around us because what we are hearing is teachings, ideas, thoughts being repeated over and over again until we come to this place of kind of a, an illusionary truth effect. The glitch in the human psyche that creates or equates repetition with truth. That the more we hear it, we think then it must be true because you've said it, you've said it, you've said it. Someone else has said it, so it's got to be true without really thinking about it. Marketers are famous for this, that you're not going to be sexy unless you drive a certain car. And then we begin to believe that. Or you're not going to be uh, attractive unless you're a certain dress size. And we begin to believe that. Politicians and even some preachers are masters at manipulating this kind of way of thinking by just repeating over and over again things that... Well, they just may not be true, but we assume they are. And sadly, thought patterns then begin to repeat themselves with monotonous regularity throughout life unless they are changed, unless they are confronted, unless they are questioned. I have to encourage you to begin to be part of this wonderful world of questioning. 
a world that begins to say, wait a minute, let me understand this. Let me search this out for myself. Let me begin to grasp this. Let me understand this. Tell me how this works because I want to apply it for my life. I want to make sure that it works for me. So I really want to just don't want to take this as some sort of teaching that's just thrown out there, some sort of thought, some idea, some sort of concept, but I want to apply it. I want to understand it myself. There's a time when the church taught a literal devil. This little devil out to get us. I, as a child, grew up thinking that there was this little uh, devil going around, you know, red tail, pitchfork, horns, out to get me, uh, always resting on this shoulder, uh, particularly, always trying to whisper in this ear, uh, that, that, you know, tempting me and always trying to tease, to get me to do things that, you know, I shouldn't be doing. And then I realized, wait a minute, is this it? I began to ask the questions. Is there really this devil? Is there really this being? The questioning, the searching, the seeking began to unfold an under greater understanding. The ideas of hell, that hell being a literal destination, it's which we would go if we did not please God, began to just create all kinds of questions for me and begin to say, wait a minute, I want to search this through and understand. Wait a minute, if God is love, when does this love of God end? That God sends us to eternal punishment. If God is grace, and grace being unmerited favor, when does this grace end? That God then says, you've used up all the grace, and so you're on your own. So we begin to look at these teachings that have been repeated over and over again, and we have to ask the questions. We have to change the patterns of thought through our searching, our seeking, our questioning, and our inquiry. Quite often, things go unchecked, unquestioned, unexamined, and we just assume them to be tr true. And then when we begin to study something or learn something, the even worst case scenario is that we don't practice that which we've learned. So we may have learned a new truth that God is love, but we forget to practice it. We learn a new truth that God is gracious and we forget to be gracious to one another. We learn the new truth that God is love in such powerful ways, full of abundance and grace and prosperity for our lives, yet we don't want to claim these things for our lives. The great errors in life is to learn, but to never question what you've learned. And the great error in life is to learn something that you've questioned and you've gotten and you understand, but to never practice it. So this is how important it is that we begin to check through that which we believe because we are part of this incredible world and we have the opportunity to make an impact, to bring about change. We can bring about a change in consciousness, in the race consciousness, the community consciousness of our world, of our community, of our family, of our friends and those around us. You know, there was a time when there was a belief that it's impossible to cultivate a desert. And so a lot of people just looked at desert land and said, nothing will ever grow there. And then there were those who said, wait a minute, let me question that. Let me search it out. And they began to say, all I've heard is it's unnatural and you wouldn't harvest anything or grow anything in the desert and it can't be done, but let me search that out for myself. Let me seek and understand. And they had the courage to check the thoughts and to find a new way of thinking. And here's what I want to present to you today, that we have an opportunity to find a new way of thinking in a world of fear, in a world that's full of all of this turmoil, conflict, a world that's full of all of this dissension and division. We have the opportunity to check our thoughts and to find a new way of thinking. Folks, common sense and science must be applied to religious and spiritual things as to everything else. And we can no longer afford this monotony of repeating over again things that are not true. And even in our own spiritual lives. Have we not heard people echoing this throughout our, our communities, our world, in consciousness and saying, well, it's assumed God is judging you. God is out to judge you. Really? Is that true? Well, it's just assumed God is withholding. God's not ready to give you all the blessings that you deserve, or, or, and you don't even deserve those. And so we have this underlying thought process that somehow God is withholding. 
You were not meant to be prosperous because good, godly people suffer. They're pious. Good, godly people go without. They make sacrifices. Good, godly people live in the realm of poverty or mediocrity. And so we accept these things as true. You're unworthy of God's blessings. And we begin to believe that and embrace that. Have we checked it? Have we questioned it? Have we examined it? Have we really looked through this? Have we searched through it ourselves? And what have we learned? The Bible gives us this beautiful example of this very experience for our lives. The ancient wisdom of scripture offers us this powerful lesson of Jesus's healing the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He sat there for 38 years along the poolside, not sunning, not working on a tan. That was not it at all. He was laying by the pool, hoping for the moment when the angel would trouble the waters. And it was a belief system that the first one in the troubled waters would be healed. So he laid by the pool, waiting for this moment, waiting for anticipation. And year after year went by. And his belief was that, well, there's no one there. There's no one there to help me. I've got, how am I going to get into the pool? How am I going to get there? And when the waters are term or troubled and when they're stirred around, is, is there some miraculous moment? I've got to be part of it, blaming someone else. And he had taken this very thought so literally. And so he waited 38 years. What he didn't understand was that the healing happens in such a beautiful way in our lives. And the story is filled with powerful symbolism and metaphor that explains the healing work in our lives. For as we look to the waters of this pool, symbolizing thought, waters all through scripture symbolizing the consciousness, our way of thinking, our thought. Here's a pool of thought. And when it's stirred by the angel, and what is it, the angel? The message of God, the messenger of God. A stirring of a new thought, a stirring of a new way of thinking, a stirring of something happening. It is then that when the waters are troubled, the first one into this new way of thinking, this new stirring of thought would experience a healing within their lives. That's truly the message that was there, but so misinterpreted. The message was then taken literally. I'm waiting for there to be a ripple in the water. I'm staring at that water and I'm looking for it. And if there is some sort of stirring of it, then let me be the first one in to experience healing. But it's when you jump into those waters of thought that are stirred, changed, renewed, that healing emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically all happens within our lives. And we as a community, as a world, may sit by the pool of thought for years, taking things so literally and waiting, waiting for someone else, sitting in our sickness, in our emotional victimhood, sitting in our sense of failure, sitting in our belief that we're no good and all these teachings or thoughts or assumptions that a community and society wants to echo over and over again. And you may sit by your pool with the beliefs of, that we are separate from everyone else. And you may sit by the pool in the sickness of believing that everyone else is wrong and you are right. And you may sit there for years because you bought into the literal and you didn't check the teaching. You didn't check and examine. You didn't search it out. You didn't seek it out to say, what does this really mean? And so Jesus asked the man, and it's very clearly he asks us the same question today. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? This created a new way of thinking. Wait a minute. You mean I could be healed? Suddenly the waters of thought are being stirred. This very messenger of God, Jesus, begins to speak in a way that says, wait a minute, I could be healed? I need to think in a new way. This is a change of thinking. And it's called him to question everything that the lame man had ever learned. Wait a minute, you're asking me this question? And if I began to think, well, of course I'd like to be healed. The response is, he had to do something then. Take up your bed and walk. Okay, wow. In life, the waters of thought are being stirred. And as we question, and then the new answers must be put into practice. 
that's shaping our beliefs. Do you want to be healed? He says, yes, he wants to be healed. Well, then take up your bed and walk. So it calls for a new response, a new way of thinking, of putting into practice that which you are now learning, discovering, and experiencing. You know, so many people will say, I was taught this, but I've been seeking and searching and questioning. And I discovered that there is a faith that can be ignited within my life. It's so practical and can form change and can transform my life and bring about manifestation. That's wonderful. But do you practice it? Practice it. Practice it. That means put it to work. Begin to manifest that which you believe. You see, the great error in our life is to learn something and not practice it. To be confronted with something of change, of way of new way of thinking, but not to put it into practice to the full extent. Years ago, I questioned my belief that God loved me as a gay man. I struggled with this. I grew up in a society, in a culture, in a world, and the assumption was God does not love gay people. God would find you an abomination. God would find you to be something that God detests. God would, one pastor told me, God would throw up or vomit the mere thought of you being gay. And growing up with that, I had to struggle with that. I had to seek and search. Is this belief, is this truth that's been told over and over again really true? How do I examine it for my life? I began to search through truth, through scriptures of God's immense love and the very teaching of God's welcoming each and every one and God seeing no partiality in any way whatsoever. Yet my society and cultural consciousness began to make me think over and over again, this can't be true. And so I began to take that which I've searched, that which I've sought to know and understand and practice it. And I began to practice from that moment. I am loved by the divine. God loves me just as I am. And as I began to practice that, it became even more real to me. It became more beneficial. It began to be the gateway to unfolding even greater understandings in my life. Now, that's just one example of searching, seeking, and understanding what we've been told down through the years. Do we really believe it? We need to know it for ourselves. It can't be something that your mother taught you or your father taught you or someone else taught you. It has to be something that you've learned for yourself. What do you know for yourself? What have you grasped? What have you understanding for yourself? What have you come to learn? And then whatever you've come to learn, when you practice it, does it work? Because if it's true, it works. So when we've learned the power of faith in new ways, the power of being affirmative versus negative, the power of living in love versus fear, we've learned new ways. Then we are called then to be people who practice it, who put it to work. Because when we do, it changes our thinking. We begin to think in new ways. Our thinking sometimes is God will one day remove poverty. And so we're as people of faith believing, waiting, God, you will one day remove poverty. We're praying for, but the truth is poverty will be one day removed and wiped out, not because God will someday decide that, that it's, God's ready to make a change, but because humanity practicing what it understands, putting it to practice the very love and compassion and caring for one another, cooperating with this wonderful understanding of God will proclaim an abundance that is there for each and every one, an abundance that always existed, and they begin to allow it to unfold. Poverty will go away when we practice that which we know to be true. We think wars will cease. Oh, when God decides that we've had enough war, that's when it'll be done for us. But no, they'll end when enough people know that it's no longer desirable. We don't want any more war. We've had enough. We're done. And we awaken to the fact that we can learn to live with one another and we can learn to share with one another and we can operate as a global community with one another and we can learn to collaborate with one another because we understand we are all one. When we understand that, we learn the lesson and then we practice it, wars will come to an end. Disease will be wiped out from this earth. It's gonna happen when we welcome good common sense 
coupled with science and the philosophy of our spiritual truth that removes this crazy ignorance that we've embodied in our lives constantly that says, well, you deserve to be sick or sickness is God's punishment on your life or you've done something wrong. So that's why you're living in this sickness as a punishment of your journey. You see, we want to break the chains of this repetition of assumptions, of thinking, of cultural way of thinking in our society, of our race consciousness, shall we say, because we are the forerunners. We are the ones who are called out to break down this kind of thinking, this separate thinking, this idea that we're not one, this divisive thinking. We're called to break it down. That's our journey. That's what we're called to awaken to, to usher in a new way of thinking by seeking, searching, learning, and then taking that which we've sought, that which we've received, that which we've learned, and practicing it in the world around us. I'm gonna tell you this, we're people of change. We're people of change. We're people of change. I can't say it enough, because that's our calling. We're people are called to bring about, facilitate the change to help the world awaken as ever before. We sing this, the light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We sing it every Sunday as we greet one another, welcome one another. But the light that we let shine is much more than a handshake and a hug and say, glad to see you. The light that we let shine and we're called to let shine is that of a light of helping one another along the pathway of transformation, of change, of coming to a new way of thinking, of awakening. 1 Timothy, in the beautiful passages within its chapters unfold so much, but it shares with us this, God has not given us the spirit of fear. That spirit of fear that we are coming in, that we're living in, fear of one another, fear that has taught us to even fear God in a sense of being terrified and frightened. All of that is not coming from the divine. Where is it coming from? It's coming from our assumptions from our lack of understanding, our misunderstanding of spiritual truth. But God has given you a spirit of power and of courage and of resolution, a spirit of love that will carry us through opposition, a spirit of a sound mind, a sound mind, one that's in quietness, stillness, not clouded over with the fears and the confusion, but in welcoming a calmness that can simply ask questions, seek and search through and discover and engage in thinking. This is what God has given us. Not a spirit of fear, but this wonderful power to embrace. And the end result would be that I'm not afraid of anything or anyone. I'm not afraid of someone who's different than me. I'm not afraid of those who may think different than me. I'm not afraid of anything or anyone. Wow. That's what God has given you, a fearless spirit of power and authority. John 14, 27 then says, peace I live, leave with you. Peace, my peace, I give it to you. I do not give it as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And I love this. Do not be afraid. Okay, so that simply says no matter what's going on around us, now, what are we here cycling over and over again? We need not be people of fear. Do not be afraid, for the peace of God is with you, a peace that passes all understanding. God has given you this power of peace for your hearts and lives. Then what's most important is that you practice it. I live a life that's love-based, not fear-based, is what you need to proclaim. I am not living in the fear of that which people are trying to propagate all around me. Instead, I'm living in the spirit of love, love for one another, love for all of humanity. I want to create a world that works for everyone, not just a few. That's the love that we want to embody within our hearts and our lives. And we want to practice, not just saying I love a certain group or I love a particular uh, aspect of our community. I love them more, but I want to create a world that works for everyone, not just a few. That's the kind of depth of love I want to practice. When we understand this, we begin to understand that 
We, can not, we need not be afraid of anything. We do not need to see anyone or anything or any religious teaching with some sort of unpleasant emotion that we're afraid of it. But instead to work through it, seek through it, to know that God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. So if there's some spiritual teaching that's causing you to fear or to be afraid, it's not of God. Let it go. If there's some assumption or something that is causing you to walk and live in fear of someone else, it's not of God. Let it go. Little by little, what happens is we release all this. We will begin to add a new thought, a new understanding, a new awareness to the consciousness. We will begin to, to begin to change this world and help it evolve in its way of thinking. Now, we can't change the entire world overnight. But change begins with how we respond to what is going on around us. How are we responding to what's going on around us? It happens to be Stonewall Weekend. It is a celebration of LGBTQ pride. It is a time when people are traditionally celebrating this wonderful understanding of self-acceptance and of great value for themselves. I mentioned this in understanding that in a light of the world today, there are many people who still would like to oppress people and believe and want to teach and create a consciousness of oppression for the LGBT community. But we know that that fearful thinking need not be part of our lives or embraced, but that we live in a world of great love, great love of a power of love that's been given to us. We can apply this very thing to all aspects of our life, of what's going on in our world around us. As we find spirit of oppression rising up out of fear, we release, we let go. We know we're not people of fear, we're people of great love. And we can build a barrier to fear then, to phobias, and to free ourselves from teachings, thoughts, ideas, a consciousness, that would somehow create division and separation and an idea in any way that we are not all one. We'll meet everything as it comes along and here's the beauty. We will learn with a new way of thinking to make the best of every scenario of every circumstance. Now it doesn't mean, making the best doesn't mean that we just grin and bear it. it doesn't mean that we suffer through it. Mm -mm. It means that we meet the challenges with a power that is greater than we are. A power that makes us fearless. That's how we meet it. We welcome this power, this presence of the divine within us that makes us fearless in every scenario. A power that says, I can question, I can ask, I can search, I can seek. A power that says, prove me, test me, put it into practice. If you believe it, then practice it, test it. If you believe that all things are possible, then are you testing that very belief by facing that which the world may call impossible and proclaiming it now possible? You see, Jesus invited us to understand that when we awaken to the very teaching that he offered us, something beautiful happens. Take my yoke upon you, he says. Learn, learn, learn of me. Learn of what I've been teaching. Learn of what I've been trying to get across to you. For I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest, not turmoil, not fear, not anxiety, not stress, but rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Today, what I want to get across to you is that there's an opportunity for you to welcome a new way of thinking. Although there may be a consciousness all around us of division, of separation, assumptions of fear in our world that we're called to live in fear, assumptions and thinking that our life was meant constantly to be living from the extent of that we are not one. And I wanna let you know that there's a new way of thinking that we're invited to participate in and to allow that to flourish within our hearts and our lives in such a way that we have an impact on the world, that we become the forebearers of change, and that we become the people who usher in that wonderful love-based consciousness that Jesus taught. 
It's a new way of thinking and it's found in the process of searching and seeking and questioning and learning. And I can't emphasize this enough. I invite you to question everything. Question it. Yes, that's right. Question and search and seek. Wrestle with every aspect of truth until you found the perfect peace that is there for you in it. And once you've found that, practice it daily. And together, we will change the world. Amen. Amen.